Why not now? This is a good time. As the 20th century starts to wind down a few more years as we get ready for century 21, what a good time to set your goals, work on yourself, work on your skills. What a good time to get it together. What a good time to start this process. Personal development, growing, changing, developing, having a good plan for your money and for your life and for your future. Why not now? You can have more than you've got because you can become more than you are. If you just remain how you are, you'll always have what you've got. But if you're willing to make changes, the next five years of your life can be totally different than the last five. If you don't change, chances are excellent the next five will be like the last five. For things to change, you've got to change. For things to get better, it's not what happens that determines your future. It's what you do about what happens. Direction determines destination. All you got to do is make a little change in direction to arrive at a brand new destination in two years, three years, five years. If you want the future to change for you, you've got to change. If you don't change, the next six years of your life is going to be just like the last six. You'll still be behind on your bills. You'll still be behind on your promises. If one of us can do it. Hey, we all can do it. And now here's my last question. Why not now? Faith comes by hearing words, good words. Somebody who well chooses their words and delivers them with uniqueness can inspire faith for somebody to believe the most impossible things can be possible. And those that excitement of possibilities comes from hearing or reading unique words. One of the best phrases I could give you for the day here it is, don't be lazy in language. Here's the first step to achieve good communications. Number one, have something good to say. That's step number one. It's fairly obvious. To have something good to say, try to recall and remember and take notes, keep journal, whatever, of your experiences because as you live your life, you're going to have something good to say. One, from your failures. Two, from your successes. You're going to have something better to say from the mistakes you've made and how you corrected it and bailed yourself out. And sometimes instead of just registering it in your head, why not commit it to paper so that it gets logged, it gets recorded, and someday you can use it for the future? Have something good to say. The key to speaking well, the key to excellent communications is preparation. Actually, all of our life is preparing. This year, preparing for the next. Those first, what, eight, nine grades preparing for high school, then high school preparing for college, college and university preparing for a career. A career to earn money, then preparing to make the investments to keep you safe and secure, build a financial wall around your family, nothing can get. Always preparing for those steps and stages in our life. That's part of the game of life. For humans, it seems like it takes us longer to prepare. After 17 years, we're not quite sure. Preparation, getting ready, sometimes seems so laborious. After going to grade one, now you gotta go to grade two. After grade two, it's grade three. Will it never end? Come on, one more grade, grade four, and then five. Wow, seems like it takes us forever to finally get ready, you know, to design a life, and get married, and have a family, and a career, and fortune, and future. But it takes preparation. Now, to communicate well, here's some good words to prepare for communication. Number one, interest. If you'll develop an interest in all of that, when it's right side up and when it's upside down, take a keen interest in the politics of the day and the speeches and all that's happening that gives you good stuff to debate and decide where do you stand on the major issues, not only the political issues, but the major life issues. Be that kind of, be that interested in life and people. So underline the word life and people. That's the whole study. Life, study life in all of its twists and turns. Study people in all of their variety. In being in an enterprise that, you know, where you have to employ people, get people to work with you, that's a challenge. Different ages, different, different opinions, different personalities, different temperaments. Here's one of the skills I learned that paid me big money, getting people to work together and see if they're all different and a whole variety. How do you get them all to work together? I'm telling you, it's not easy. It is a challenge organizing, getting people to work together. Now, if you're working with independent people, then it really is challenging. I promise you 
a paycheck like you cannot believe. Here's what's interesting about people. The ones who should do it the most are inclined the least. How come they can't see it? I don't know. I can see it. They can't see it. Maybe right now they're not supposed to see it. That, that's the best I said. Sometimes you just got to take the easier way out. I don't know. If that's an easier way out than to try to explain it all. That's just the way it is. Somebody you thought was going to stay, they leave. Here's what you have to learn to say. Isn't that interesting? And somebody that you thought was going to leave, what? They stay and you say, I wouldn't have thought that in a hundred years. There's a surprise a day waiting for you, working with people. Next, sensitivity. Trying to understand where people are, where they're coming from, the position they might be in at the moment. Trying to understand a night visits us all after days and some winters are tough and some people are having a tough time. Be sensitive to all that. Next is simply knowledge. Just gather every idea you can that makes you a better communicator. Now we must learn to say it well. Once you've got something, now you can't mumble. If you've got something good to say, you can't mumble, right? It's got to be clear or no matter how good the message is that you've got to deliver, how good the instructions, how good the ideas, no matter how good they are, if you don't deliver them well, now the power is lost and the opportunity is lost. So number one is to have something good to say and number two is to say it well. Here's what'll help you to say it well. Make this list. Number one, sincerity. If a message is delivered with sincerity, see, that makes all the difference. If the speaker is sincere, if the father is sincere, if the mother is sincere, see, that's captivating for the children. If, if, the, if the friend is sincere, even covering a delicate subject for us of some changes we probably should make, if they're sincere, see, we will give them room perhaps to get on our case if we know they're sincere, not just trying to criticize for criticizing sake. If your sincerity, I'm telling you that wins the day. Here's what can really be accomplished. Hopefully like this weekend here, someone sincerely willing to speak and someone sincerely willing to listen. Now in terms of lecture, book, seminar, and all the rest, we must come to this conclusion because it's a wise conclusion that sincerity is not a test of truth. In your study and evaluating everything, just make sure you have that in the back of your mind. Sincerity is not a test of truth. We must not make the mistake of saying he must be right. He's so sincere. See, that might be a mistake. Why is that? Here's why. It's possible to be sincerely wrong. So sincerity is not a test of truth. Here's the only test of truth. Truth. Truth is the only test of truth, not sincerity. We hope someone will be both truthful and sincere but we don't mistake sincerity for truth. Next is vocabulary. The better your vocabulary, the better you can share ideas that are meaningful. Find words now to use that you couldn't use before. Interesting story on vocabulary. Some friends of mine took a survey among prisoners many, many years ago. Some rehabilitation program they were working on for prisoners. They weren't looking for this, but here's what they found. There's definitely a connection between vocabulary and behavior. And here's what they discovered. The more limited the vocabulary, the more tendency to poor behavior. Isn't that interesting? And when you think about it for a while, you can say, well, I can see where that would be. If you were very limited in your ability to comprehend because you had such a small vocabulary, that no matter what someone said, it would still be confusing. No matter what they said, it still might not make sense. They said it clear, but you couldn't see it. And sometimes that's because the vocabulary is so limited that it doesn't have the ability to register the scene on the screen of your consciousness. Here's the fourth step to good communication. Intensity, the spirit, power, and emotion with which you translate your communication. Intensity gives power to vocabulary. Words are just words, but here's what's powerful. Words loaded with emotion. You see, that's what's powerful. You say, is the word powerful? Yes, the, the word's powerful, but the emotion is so much more. It's different reading the word bastard in the dictionary and have somebody call you. If a word is a word, say no, a word just isn't a word. It all depends, right? It depends, it depends. So emotion is like, if I took a little straight pin, right? Guy buys a shirt, it's got all these pins in it, right? You got to take out all these pins. If I took one of these little straight pins and I threw it at you and it hit you in the face or the hands, you'd feel it, this little straight pin. But what if I took that little straight pin and wired it to the end of an iron bar about to slip. See, and I let you have it with that, I could drive the pin through your heart. So the little pin is the words and the iron bar is the emotion. 
that give the words power, that gives the words weight, that makes it strike the consciousness. And your words can become so powerful it can strike somebody's consciousness and they say, oh, wow, now I know what I did wrong. Now I understand the difficulty. Now I can see. And words can become that powerful that they strike the heart, they strike the mind, they strike the consciousness so that somebody can see. So since words are that powerful mixed with emotion, here's what's important. Next line, learn to measure your emotion. You've got to use it very wisely. Well-chosen words, yes. But now we need measured emotion and well-chosen. But words loaded with emotion, it's so powerful that you got to measure. Too much firepower destroys the opportunity. We say we don't shoot a cannon at a rep. That's too much firepower. It's effective, but you've got no more rep. One of my colleagues years ago said, you should have been there, Jim Rohn, but listen to my talk. He said, I blew them all away. I said, oh no, where are they now? You, you blew them all away? That's too much. We don't, you don't need to blow everybody away. We're talking now about being effective. Here's the key, enough emotion. Now the men have to work on enough, and probably the, the female side has to work on a bit of restraint. The men, a bit more, enough, and the women, not too much. And we all have to measure that, whether it's in our business, whether it's in sales, or whether it's speaking to a child, enough but not too much. I mean, this, you can't believe what a little bit of course on this stuff will do in helping you to sense some things you didn't sense before, see some things you didn't see before, and pick up some signals you never picked up before by just paying attention. Now your effectiveness multiplies by two, by three, by five, by 10. It's, it's fabulous, this is fabulous. Okay, now what is the intensity? It's the blend of all your emotions and all your experiences that have affected you. The key is to keep and store those so that they're handy and near the surface. Because here's the next key now in making a presentation, having a conversation. Number one, identification. If you have available to you all of your experiences close at hand, now you can identify with someone. Here's what identification means, making yourself real to someone else, hopefully in the very beginning. If a man talks to a man, that's a pretty easy identification. If a man talks to a woman, a lot more difficult. If we're the same, if we're sort of the same, it's a lot easier to identify. Here's what identification means, building a bridge between you and someone else by relating some common experience. You start with that, but now how does a, an adult 40 relate to a child of 12? That's a long bridge from 40 to 12. How would you do that to get the child's attention? How would you do that to build a bridge so you could have a, a good conversation? Here's one of the keys, remember when you were 12. Now they can't remember 40, but you can remember 12. I remember almost every day of being 12. One challenge of being 12, you're not 13. Right, the teenager are off going somewhere, so no, you can't come, you're only 12, only 12. If I heard that once, I heard it 100 times, you're only 12. I couldn't wait to get out of 12. I seem to be stuck in 12. If you're not a teenager, I, maybe that's changed now, but I mean, back then, I'm telling you, 12 was an unbelievably tough year. Close, but not close enough. So you got to identify. I remember when I was 12. I said, really? Sure. If I've got children and you've got children, even though I'm a father and you're a mother, but at least if we have children, we have something in common. Little things you can think of that helps to build a bridge fairly quickly between you and someone so that you have a better chance now to communicate well. We call this simply identification. Next key to good communication is learn to attack the problem but not the person. This is an art. Too often we attack the person that is so closely identified with the problem. The key is to attack the problem. We expect the doctor not to attack the patient. But we expect the doctor to attack the disease, to attack the problem, to make the operation successful, save the patient destroy the disease, destroy the diseased organ. So here's what we expect a doctor to be, very professional. So you can't be reckless here now going after the problem when it seems like you're going after the person. You've got to be like a surgeon. This is important stuff here because a lot of people really get destroyed here by not being careful like a surgeon. 
Matters of the heart are delicate. You can't operate on the heart with a hatchet. If you were about to go under for the heart operation and you heard the doctor say, hand me the hatchet, you'd come awake. Say, no, what do you mean? We're talking about my heart here. No, and some people go after matters of the heart with a hatchet. Right? Too severe. They're not careful enough to handle the problem, to go after the problem. But the key is to save the patient. And this is why you have to use this language even with your children. I love you, but I hate what's happening. I don't hate you. God sometimes has this difficulty. Saying, I love you, but I hate your sinful ways. Now, since me and my sinful ways are so sort of wrapped up together, I have a tendency to think, well, maybe God hates me. And God says, no, let me make it clear one more time. I don't hate you. I love you, but I hate what's happening. Your sinful ways that are carrying you away, your sinful ways that are leading you to destruction, your sinful ways that will soon have you dead. That's what I hate. Right? The sinful ways that's got their fingers around your throat, shutting off the air supply. That's what I hate. I hate the enemy, not you. I hate the enemy. And if you learn to deal with your kids that way, they'll appreciate what you hate as long as they know what you love and what you hate. And sometimes you just got to say it. You got to make it clear. I don't hate you, but I hate what's going on. I hate what I see. I hate what's happening. I don't feel good about it. I feel good about you, but not about it. See, if you make it clear, that kind of communication is so useful. It is so powerful. Adjust your style to fit the occasion and the emotional content so that it works, so that it makes sense. That when you burst on the scene, it's called for. The point is called for that much emotion. This is a craft. Don't get lazy here. And the reason I ask you not to get lazy here is because the payoff is so great. Whether it's working on a job or advancing your career or at home with your family or communicating with your spouse, whatever it is, craft your communications. Be a little more aware and just ask yourself, could I possibly get better at affecting people with my language and my words and my style and my emotions and all the rest? And the answer is yes, we all could.